right, on to our next presenter and delighted to welcome Coda partner Catalyze APAC, all the way from New South Wales. Uh, who are going to Paul Gordon, the CEO and Technical Director of Catalyze APAC, going to talk to us about transforming obstacles to assets, positive stakeholder engagement in decommissioning decision making. Welcome, Paul. Good morning, everyone. It's actually afternoon in New South Wales, so I'm not quite sure what time zone I'm in. Uh, really wonderful to be here and uh, acknowledgement to everyone sitting in the room here. We're in the final stretch for the conference and we finally get to the best bit, talking about decision making and stakeholders. So uh, well done for your commitment. So um, my name is Paul Gordon, as, as Sean said, I run a boutique consulting company based in Sydney. We've got offices in Canberra and Wellington. And our business is kind of, we're a little bit of an outlier in this space. We, we are not born and bred of the oil and gas industry. We're actually born and bred of the decision science world. Who's heard of decision science before? No, most people haven't. <laughs> Short knives, that's right. We've told him lots about it. Um, so yes, we're just kind of decision scientists. We, in fact, my passion is to transform the way the world makes decisions that matter. And we work in all sorts of spaces, from oil and gas, to defense, to transport, to environment, to pharmaceuticals, kind of you name it, because uh, who here makes decisions? Yep, pretty much everyone's making decisions. So it's one of those interesting areas that needs a lot of attention, doesn't get a lot of attention. And, uh, and as you can see, this kind of work we've done has touched many different places in many different ways. We also have a sister company in the UK uh, with also a lot more oil and gas uh, history, especially up in the North Sea. So um, great to be in this conversation. So why do I say that stakeholders are obstacles? Why do we think stakeholders are obstacles? Well. Uh, let me suggest things that might apply. You can't do that, say the stakeholders, I don't agree with you. This isn't what I want to do. The regulators say you have to listen to us. I'm going to take this up with my local member. And of course, we've all seen the headlines where stakeholders have turned into not just obstacles, but activists getting in the way of our decisions, boycotting decommissioning. In fact, our journey as a company on this work started with Shell back in uh, the North Sea in the Brent field. Uh, anyone here remember Brent Alpha? I'm sure you do. Yeah, I've got lovely photographs of it still sitting in a nice fjord, rusting beautifully. So that was a perfect example of decision making gone wrong. When they were looking at Delta, they said, we've got to do this differently, so let's bring in a new way of thinking about decision making. How do we have stakeholders in the room with us? The other reason stakeholders look, can look like obstacles to us is, of course, we have to. The regulations say in putting forward an environment plan, you must consult stakeholders. So there's no choice. So, of course, it's hard work. I don't really want to do it. The regulator says I have to. Stakeholders feel like a great big pain in the neck. And unfortunately, that is how a lot of organizations approach the idea of stakeholders. Not a great place to start from. Now, I'd like to put forward an alternative hypothesis. In fact, not a hypothesis, something that's well, been well tested, that actually stakeholders can be an asset in our decision making, particularly around decommissioning. Why? Why could they be an asset? Well, firstly, diversity always improves decision making. And I know we as humans don't like that. That's a, kind of the dirty secret of being a human being is we're actually trained to not be diverse. We like people like ourselves. I love it to hear uh, a British accent at the front of the room going, oh, I feel at home, you know. I, I notice my own lack of diversity. But it always improves decision making. So if we can bring some diversity to our decision making, that's going to improve it. Secondly, Actually, active engagement of stakeholders can help us in easing our EP submission. Now, I had a chat with uh, David from Nopsima yesterday, and I know if he was sitting here, he'd say, no, just, just, uh, just a second, this is not a game to try and get your EP through more easily. That's not the point. The point is, it helps take some of the barriers out the way. Definitely, it can be much more efficient decommissioning execution. With stakeholders on board, you haven't now got people boycotting the ports. You haven't got all of that's gone away. And in fact, what you've got is an environment that's much more supportive and helping with our operations. And really, the big game here is social license. We all need social license to operate. The things that we're doing we need to have support out there in the world. And when we lose our social license, well, that's exactly what happened to Shell for a while after Brent Alpha. Uh, we know the impacts of that. So stakeholders can be our greatest asset. Social license, easing our processes, 
helping pr bring diversity to our decision making. So I think really the opportunity is to embrace stakeholders as a fundamental part of the pro decision process for decommissioning. Actually embrace them, not go, okay, they're a must do tick box kind of thing. I guess from what we would consider stakeholder consultation, that's how most people think of it. In fact, the regulation even uses the word consultation, to participation. How can stakeholders be part of what we're doing? Well, all sounds nice, yeah, we're, all, we're up for that, aren't we? But sounds a bit hard, how do we do it? So what I want to do today is just kind of, in the short time I've got, point to probably five things that we can do very practically that shift this obstacles to assets for stakeholders. And just because I'm a decision person, I like to put a process diagram up on the screen and I feel a little bit inadequate against all the wonderful engineering pictures and pictures of vessels, I don't have any of that. But here's a kind of reasonably typical decision process for decommissioning. So we've got to somehow come to a view on what's our end state that we, that we believe is the, the way forward that we're going to submit to our regulator for approval. And so we're going to start back here. We're going to design some kind of process. Uh, we're going to talk about stakeholders, which typically would be a communications plan. How do we tell them what we're going to do and hope they don't argue with us? That's what that would typically look like. We're going to need some options. What might some end states look like, some uh, recycling processes, whatever. And we're going to need some criteria. How do we choose what the best way forward is? Then we're going to have some kind of conversation that looks at what are these options, how do the criteria stack up, that gives us our preferred end state that then goes into an EP. So this is a pretty typical process. In fact, uh, in different parts of the world, we'd call this a comparative assessment. It's actually recommended by, uh, sometimes by the regulators in, in their view on how to make good decisions. Great, that's a standard process. But where's the stakeholder bit in that? Well, here's the opportunity. Firstly, got to think of it like stakeholders have a role to play throughout. It's not we tell them what we're going to do, we get the regulation, and then we tell them what we've done. Okay, That is not it. In fact, uh, I was working with one of the uh, local companies around here. I won't mention their name. Um, and they said, oh, yeah, our process is DAD. Oh, what's DAD? Decide, announce, defend. So we decide what we're going to do, we tell the stakeholders, and then when they fight, we defend. That's what we've got to turn away from. And here's how. So firstly, even back here in the design of our decision process, we could have a stakeholders in that conversation. In fact, we could even have, so the regulator's a stakeholder. I know we don't like to think of them that way, but the regulator's a stakeholder. They could be in this conversation for what's the process we're going to use to make some decisions. That will have them at least visible to what we're doing, give them a very early heads up. The key word yesterday we heard from NOPSEMA was get us involved early. So early engagement. Great, we can have stakeholders there. They could participate in a conversation about process design. Now what's cool about that is, most people can get into a useful conversation about process without it getting heated, without it getting partisan, without people kind of throwing stuff at you. It's like, okay, yeah, we can agree on the process. The second opportunity is here, once we've got our plan, let's actually ask the stakeholders how they'd like to be part of this. Don't just tell them, here's the three pieces of information you're going to get over the next five years. Actually get to into a conversation. So here's some opportunities. How would you like to? Do, should we come and talk to you? Do you want to come and talk to us? Do you want to come to a workshop? Do you want to see? So ask them, how do they want to participate? Then, here, we want to ask stakeholders, and this is really crucial. In fact, if there's one thing to remember from this, it's this point. Ask stakeholders for their perspectives. Don't ask them to make the decision or ask them what they will or won't accept. Because the minute I say to you, you know, are you okay with a leave in situ? And you go, oh no, I'm an environmental activist, no way. Now you've, you've made your position. In fact, what happens, we build a Brexit scenario, which now means it's me against you, and if it doesn't go your way, we're in trouble. So do not ask, what should we do? Do not ask them to make a decision. Say, what are the things that affect you in this decommissioning situation? Oh, yeah, I'm a local business operator. What affects me is, I don't know, the, all the, the workers coming through and whatever it might be. Okay, we know what affects you, what matters to you. Okay. Then include what we learn from them 
in our key aspects of our process. Oh yeah, they said what matters to them is, I don't know, the risk on property prices in the location where all this activity is going to be coming through. Okay, we need to factor that in to our decision process, maybe through our criteria or through our options. Oh, the stakeholders said, I run a little, you know, commercial fish, uh, 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 recreational fishing operation. Frankly, what would really serve my business would be this new artificial reef thing. Okay, we heard that. We should think about that here. And then opportunity number five is actually have them in the decision process. Now, this often shocks a lot of people going, no, 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 no. The whole point is we, the title holder, it's up to us to make the decision. We close all the doors. We tell everyone else to clear off. We get around in a huddle and we say, okay, this is what we're going to do. No, no, no. Open the doors. Have the stakeholders come to the table. Have them be in the discussion where we say, okay, we're looking at this option compared to this option. How does it play out? Oh, well, actually, in my view, from a cultural perspective, it plays out this way. Oh, that's great. And in my view, from a risk perspective, it plays out in this way. That's a conversation you can have with stakeholders in the room, allowing them to participate in what the decision actually turns out to be. One of the key things that shifts stakeholder mindset from big oil screwing up the planet and doing me a disservice into, oh, okay, we get it, is a level of transparency of what's actually happening in the decision process. So that's fundamental here. So in summary, five keys to success I see. Firstly, design your decision process in collaboration with stakeholders, but also with the stakeholder team. So, you know, of course, any of you as uh, title holders will have stakeholder comms teams, PR teams, whatever. Get them in the room in designing the decision process. Secondly, ask stakeholders how they want to participate. Third, ask for their perspectives. Do not say, tell me what we should do. Fourth, explicitly include their perspectives through the criteria or the options in your decision process. And then finally, have them at the table in making your decision. That will turn our stakeholders from the obstacles that we're trying to overcome to the assets that can really help us through our decision process and ultimately through our decommissioning activity. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. It's an absolutely fascinating structured approach to turning things around. Any immediate questions in the room for Paul? I'll give you a question you could ask me. When you say stakeholders, who do you mean? Well, who I mean is you imagine anyone that might be impacted by your decommissioning activity. That's why I'd say it ranges from the regulator, your internal people, if you're an operator, for example, the local fishing uh, people, the local indigenous communities, the uh, environmental activists. All of those people are stakeholders. You've got to take a very broad view. Great question. Thank you for asking. <laughs> My experience was that uh, Nopsima was really reluctant to come to the room and didn't really want to be involved. So what's changed? That your, your sort of philosophy works? Because they are a big part of, of the surprises when they say no or they dislike something. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a great question. And every time I talk about this and from the work that we've done over a number of different um, decommissioning decisions, I'm always saying, let's just keep checking with Nopsima really what's their appetite. And their appetite is definitely shifting. And one of the ways to help shift that is right back to that step one. Even if all they do is they're across the process you're going to use, so you're not asking them to give any kind of indication of what they might or might not accept. You're just saying, if we use this process, does that work for you? Just that dialogue and conversation helps them go, well, maybe you want to adjust it a little bit because maybe it's taking too long or maybe you've got the wrong people in the conversation. So they're definitely willing to have that conversation and we, we know that's for sure. I think with a bit more time and especially as this world of decommissioning in Australia really ramps up, they're going to find themselves wanting to be more engaged because ultimately the win for them is if they see an EP come forward that's been well-founded in good decision process with strong stakeholder participation, it's going to be easier for them to come to a judgment and that actually makes their life easier. So they're shifting I, I'm, and I don't want to pretend that they're like, oh yes, we love this, come, we'll come to everything. That's not the case, but definitely Start back here. And early is the word that they said. The word that came out of their mouths yesterday was talk to us early. So talk about the decision process early. 
Thank you. It's also been uh, Coda's experience recently. We've worked closely with Nopsema. We've seen them open up. They've seen them more and more willing to engage with the industry. They don't necessarily want to be put on the spot. Our role in Coda as an independent body is to create an, an, an environment in which industry and the regulators can come together and talk about scenarios and best practice rather than I need this decision right now. And that makes a big shift. So they, they, they remain open to it but you're right you do have to keep checking back to make sure that what you heard is actually what you think you heard any other questions if not i'll just say thank you very much indeed paul we really appreciate catalyze as a code partner coming over and uh, being part of this today and uh, thank all of you for sort of staying to the end uh, and contributing as well we do really appreciate it thank you thank you